a long time ago on a comics page far, far away. Welcome to Panel Up, your monthly pop culture panel. I'm John Campbell. And I am Mike Gergoni. Oh, Gergoni, it is the holiday season and uh, and all that that encompasses. Yeah, for good or for ill, we are now into a long stretch of holidays and the music that is associated with it and the TV and movies that we all love slash hate that also go along with all of it. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I, I would. It's interesting. I uh, I don't know about you, but my family is very uh, you go. My family tends to go Christmas crazy. My father in particular. And the thing about it is, sometimes I get a reputation for being kind of a Grinch, and I I, I swear I'm not. I love Christmas in its place. What I am not on board for is the three months of Christmas it's turned into now. That gets sure. that burns me out a little bit, you know. So. I would call my family uh, Christmas agnostic. We appreciate Christmas if we all happen to be in the same place at the same time, but otherwise we can take it or leave it. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, that's that's a different thing. Everyone is contained in the same area here for me, so it it, it turns it into there's no uh, there's no escaping it. Um, not that I, I don't want know if to. you're picking up the wood chipper in the background of my audio here, so I apologize well, I, if that's you're always out in the middle of rural nowhere where somebody's doing intense work. It seems like at your place. <laughs> I live in the suburbs. I just happen yeah. to be in the middle of a construction zone ninety percent so of the funny. time. You are, you live in the suburbs. I'm you know out in you know at least uh, on the edge on the very edge of downtown, and yet you're always the one with sound issues, and there's nothing going on over here. Look, all I can say is that they're doing a bang up job removing the dead limbs right now. Yeah, man, <laughs> they got to get rid of those dead limbs. Well. <laughs> I was going to say, since it is the holiday season, something we haven't had for a while is Doctor Who for the holidays. It's true. For the longest time, especially during our uh, media as a- adolescence, let's call it, uh, yeah. we have had a pretty spectacular run of consistent Doctor Who. Like, honestly... They talk about this big gap of time in which Doctor Who didn't exist. That wasn't around when, like, except for when we were real, real young and wouldn't have had an appreciation for it anyway. No, that's it exactly. We definitely are firmly of, uh, as Whovians, which both of us are pretty pretty hardcore yeah. about our about our Doctor Who, um, but we definitely grew up in, the, in, in, in this relaunch era, starting with, and which will bring us to where we are now even, because he's returned, of course, starting with the Russell T. Davies relaunch with Chris Eccleston, right? Uh, yeah. Or even the, even the Paul McGann TV movie, to a certain extent. I um, didn't get to that till later, but I definitely hit the ground running with Eccleston, and I was like, oh, yeah. Doctor Who, what's this? A sci-fi uh, thing that I'm not a huge fan of? Well, better change yeah. that. Doctor Who was like uh, the, my before Eccleston. My only experience with Doctor Who was I knew what Tom Baker looked like. I probably thought he was the only Doctor, mm-hmm. and because I, had, you know, I mean, just being a nerd in, in the nerd sphere as a kid and stuff like that, you saw the hat and scarf Doctor Who, and you were like, "Oh, that's that British guy." I don't know what his deal is because it wasn't like readily available either. I feel like I watched enough PBS as a yeah. kid. That I'd occasionally catch a rerun with zero context yeah. and not really understand what differentiated Doctor Who from shows like Wishbone and the Magic School Bus. Yeah, he was around. I don't think I, I didn't. I was just like, oh, yeah, that's like because they were once again, it's such a weird media landscape now for young people where it's like but like British stuff wasn't a plenty when we were kids. They, there was around, but it had a, it was almost like, oh, well, that's a British thing, isn't it? If it wasn't Monty Python, right. you had to try pretty dang hard to get your hands on it. That was it. It was it was Monty Python. It was it was the PBS thing, right? So it was Monty Python, or um, being the kind of kid I was, it was masterpiece mystery and like the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes, that kind of stuff, or the the David Suchet uh, Poirot. You know. Occasionally, you'd catch like reruns on some deeper cable networks of like Faulty Towers or something. Yeah, that's the thing. But it, but I said it always sort of had this thing about it was othered in a way to me, where I was like, oh, yeah. that 
that comes from England. Uh, Mr. Bean was as close as a lot Mr. of us Bean. got. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that's the thing about it. It is uh, now what's great is everything. I mean, I, you know, I go on Max and I go, hey, this show looks interesting. Oh, it's from Sweden. Oh, that's because there's just it, the walls have completely come down, which is fantastic. Yeah. We get I love my uh, South Korean historical zombie apocalypse uh, drama. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. And, and you'll get things where it's like, I love Lupin on um, mm, on mm-hmm, Netflix, mm-hmm. and that's like the most watched show on Netflix, and it's a French show. You know, you yeah. like this. It's just great. Um, but that all leads us back to this. Yes, uh, the thing about uh, Doctor Who, uh, you know, it, it, I really, I do feel like it's not just us. Like it, that's it really became a worldwide phenomenon sometime in that Eccleston to Tennant to Smith era, right? Like that's where yeah. it started to get gain a lot of popularity. And we're here talking about the 60th anniversary specials, but we were there when 10 years ago. Remember, the 50th anniversary special was the biggest thing in the world. We saw it in theaters. We did. Yes, absolutely. I, I also went to the, um, I've been to a couple of these in theaters because I used to go to the last Capaldi special in theaters as well, mm. um, where a bunch of grown men were trying to be like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it, it's, it's, it's certainly grown immensely in popularity. Uh, so much so that now Disney's got their their uh, cartoon gloved mitts on it, and the cartoon gloved mitts are important because next year Mickey Mouse becomes uh, 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 public, public domain. domain. But specifically, yeah. it's Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse who doesn't wear the gloves. So the gloves are actually pretty important. Yeah, yeah, that is a thing about like when Disney fought to do this. Like, dude, I I, I think I think Mickey Mouse is going to be fine, even if he's in public domain. <laughs> I mean, like, People will still know Disney Mickey Mouse. It's like yeah, uh, but yeah, it's it's a little bit of a shocker to see rolling around at the the top of this month Doctor Who showing up on Disney Plus. Uh, you know a little bit more about the the deal here. It, it seems to me like they don't have they didn't just buy Doctor Who because no Doctor no Who no is not readily available on Disney Plus. No, uh, f- starting now Doctor Who is uh, a combined BBC Disney uh, production. But okay. it's still, so that that's the idea is, um, the, the thing is, yes, so up until, BBC owns Doctor Who, but basically starting at this special where we're beginning is the first of Disney influence. So no, they don't own Doctor Who outright like they do Star Wars and things like that. Right. But they are the American home of Doctor Who. And I think more than America even. Basically, I think anywhere outside of England, it is on Disney now. But just That's... the new episodes. The old episodes are still contained. Yeah, Max, uh, Warner Brothers, through whatever deal they had with home video... Still has the starting. This is this is where if you're if you're into Doctor Who, it's like, okay, starting with the Christopher Eccleston stuff through Jodie Whittaker, it's all on Mac. Anything before that is over on BritBox, which is its own streaming service specifically for British television. Um, which, if you're into British television, I do actually will say is well worth the uh, the subscription. Because, but that's just because I, you know, I need my dark British detective dramas. I need them, <laughs> man. If you can't have instant access to Luther, what are you even doing? I absolutely put that in my veins, man. <laughs> if somebody's gonna do some murder in this town, I get that, then I'm watching it. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is uh, the this is the starting place of uh, of Disney as the new home. But the great thing about about that is that we get these at the same time as they come out in England and they're available to everybody everywhere. So that's nice because it used to be sort of a thing for a while. It was like there was a gap or you had to have the BBC cable channel to be able to watch BBC America. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a long, there's a long time when like the streaming home or the, you know, if, if you didn't have cable, uh, it was very hard to watch Doctor Who. Yeah. Which uh, is kind of speaks to it how universally it speaks to people in terms of like it was able to catch on in an era where it wasn't easy for it right? to catch on. Absolutely. Uh no, that's what that's what's crazy about it. Um is it, it, it speaks to the quality of the of the thing. Cause I, I think that and and Sherlock was the other big one mm-hmm. from England that just became like global phenomenons. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh 
it's it's interesting now having it become a part of the kind of pop culture milieu that Disney has created because it feels it feels like it should have maybe been there the whole time to me well, it it's not the most it's 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 not a bad fit right like yeah like that's the thing about it. I mean people have talked about Disney is slowly taking over every science fiction thing it's pretty they pretty much are a star trek away from having their hands <laughs> on every major science fiction franchise basically yeah. um so it it is it is interesting but also there is and particularly in England this is the case and has been cuz you know this is this is the 60th anniversary of the show um, Doctor Who came on even before Star Trek, which is crazy to think about. Um, mm. But uh, it's a family franchise over there. It is a gather round, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, all the kids, everybody can watch Doctor Who. So it kind of makes sense that Disney is our family brand. That's you know? what they would have us believe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's, but I mean like like that's that's the thing because that that includes the parks and stuff like that. It's like sure. oh, everybody loves Disney. They have it's built themselves entertainment. Yeah, to be giant. as family friendly, as widely accessible, and as inclusive as possible, and that can rub some people the wrong way, but <laughs> it is what they're building their brand to be. That's it exactly. Yeah, I know it's it's an interesting thing when when you had. You know, we don't need to get into, but like when we when, when you had Disney being railed against for stuff, and you're like, boy, you know, Disney is as like, uh, they're 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 going to be the last people to take a bold take on anything because the whole appeal is we we embrace everybody. So when you're like, man, Disney's get you, you know, Disney's out there, man. I don't agree with their politics or whatever. <laughs> and you're like, Disney doesn't have politics, man. Disney's Disney, you know. So yeah. it, it it speaks to the embracing of these of this diversity and culture, right? If Disney's on board with it, <laughs> yeah, Disney's not going to stand out alone themselves. So, uh, but no, I do think I do think it fits really well, and I think that that's the I. It almost feels like that's the case when you yeah when you log into your Disney Plus, and there's Doctor Who. He doesn't seem like uh, you're not like wait what? It's like oh yeah, this goes no. with the others. The larger curveball right now for me on Disney Plus is the Hulu channel in Disney Plus. Yeah, that that was always going to come, right? Like that has sure, to. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad they're doing that because it's honestly been a thing where it's like I don't understand. You guys already owned Hulu. I you- there. I I spent like a good twenty minutes the other night trying to figure out the differences between what's yeah. on Hulu that's on Disney Plus versus what's on Hulu Hulu, mm-hmm. and it's obviously like a rights and distribution thing. Right. But, like, some of the stuff doesn't make sense because, like, Shorzy, the Letterkenny spinoff, is yeah. on Disney+. Plus, But Letterkenny itself, which it's is a Hulu Apple original, Apple. is not on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, that is weird. And that's absolutely uh, got to be a rights thing. Yeah, I just um, can't get my well, head around it for now. One of the things that's 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 really weird to think about is Hulu is only in America and I, th- and, and I think Canada. Um but uh, so Hulu doesn't exist in any in like any of these other major countries. So there's a thing called Star that 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 we don't get in America. I've only recently discovered this, and that's where all the Hulu stuff is for Disney. But it's it's been attached to Disney, and that's basically where like mature content went that wasn't Disney appropriate. Interesting. So where a lot of stuff they make that comes out on Hulu specifically. Is well, that seems to be changing because there's like a mature content filter now on Disney Plus. Yeah, there's there's a weird there's a whole weird thing as they're, you know, Disney like a lot of streaming services they're still in flux, right? Sure. I mean, nothing beats Paramount Plus, including Showtime or whatever it is that they <laughs> call it. Uh, Paramount Plus with Showtime is now the actual well, name of that streaming service. And that's the weird thing about the Hulu channel inside Disney Plus, right? Is that because of certain distribution deals, there is stuff from a ton of other companies on Hulu, including stuff from like Warner Brothers and Showtime and right, uh, right. like every other network you can think of. I was surprised to see a bunch of Cartoon Network stuff on there. I was like, oh, I thought Zaslav killed all this. Cool. Yeah, that's well. That's a weird thing too. Is like I'm starting to see like DC movies are showing up like on Amazon because Warner Brothers mm. is selling 
for parts. So they're like, hey, do you want to buy our movies and stream them on your service? You're like, but don't you have a service? Ah. If you go to HBO, if you go to Max right now, yeah. the Watchmen show isn't there anymore. No. That's Why insane. Would... Yeah. But it might be on like Netflix. Like it's weird. Yeah. That, that it, like that's that's the thing that's crazy is they're 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 you know selling the the streaming rights of that stuff. Um, so uh, let's talk about anyway, what, yeah, where we find out because Doctor Who itself is in a weird place because there was you know we talked about the the heights it reached, but it's 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 been kind of in a lull. I don't think it's lost. Uh, you know. Uh, it was in no danger of not existing anymore, but definitely the most recent seasons have been the worst received, um, both critically and uh, ratings-wise, in the show's run, for or at least certainly in modern era. It's definitely one of those shows that has had to evolve over the years as the creative voices behind it have moved on and shuffled forward. It is not one of those shows that has had a supremely consistent uh, creative voice behind it. There is no like showrunner who spans the entirety of the new who era. Um, we get like runs and the way I think about it is all very similar to the way I think about uh, comic book runs, yeah. right? Is you'll have authors who get in there for certain periods of time and can really radically redefine characters or like create superlative, uh, consistent runs that people point to and say, oh, this is the good chunk. This is the bad chunk. This is the chunk that had its highs and its lows. And right. that's kind of where Doctor Who's been at for the last like, I don't know, six or seven years for me. Well, it's interesting because we talked about the relaunch that started and was it 04? Is that when it came back? Uh, uh, 06. 06, okay. Was when it came back. And that was under Russell T. Davies, the showrunner, with Christopher Eccleston playing the Doctor. And then Davies stuck around through David Tennant mm -hmm. through the end of his run. Then when, when, when Tennant left, Davies left and handed it over to Stephen Moffat, who I know I think we have a particular love for the Stephen Moffat. You know I mean, that's Matt, that Matt Smith is my doctor. I don't know what else to say about that. It's an interesting thing because actually, I, I David Tennant is my favorite doctor. But I think sure. in terms of the writing of the show, it was to me at its best under Moffat. Now I love the the like Tennant to Smith to Capaldi, all three of those guys. It you, you're talking about very close in my love for each of them. It's not. It's no radically different uh, there sure. so that that that's that's like peak who to me is like tenant through capaldi but mm. specifically moffat brought this very uh very heady trippy like long he had these long games planned around he had you know there's the season that envelopes back on itself and stuff like that yeah um and i love so, a lot some of that might too. say maybe a little too into itself at times and that was that was why I think there are people who prefer, the the Russell T Davies people thought maybe you know maybe he's getting this guy's a little too clever for his own good. Um, and so interesting that then of course he goes off and creates Sherlock, which is nothing but cleverness on top of cleverness and puzzle boxes and you know. Uh, so it's 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 an interesting thing. I also uh, highly recommend his show Inside Man, which is on uh, Netflix, Moffat's most recent show with David Tennant and Stanley mm. Tucci. That cool. is. Really, very good. Now it's just uh, a touch of the tooch. Oh, it's it's yeah, it's a touch of the tooch. It's a touch of the tooch, but I will say the tooch is loose as well in it. Uh oh, um, well, if the tooch is loose, uh, tooch is loose because <laughs> he is uh, the pitch for that show is what if the what if Sherlock Holmes but on death row? What if the most genius detective in the world is actually a, a, a killer on death row? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's really, it's very and, cool. And uh, that person is Stanley Tucci? That person is Stanley Tucci. Okay, and so okay, okay. he never leaves the prison, so you have to bring him all the clues and everything. And yeah, it's it's very, it's very, very cool. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, it's a lot of fun. But uh, uh, so then we had, I, I when Moffat left with Capaldi, there was sort of a... Not, you know, the, Doctor Who's interesting because, you know, for those, obviously, if you're watching this, you probably are somewhat familiar, but the, 
in baked into the DNA of the show is this idea that it's constantly rebooting itself with these regenerations, which is one of those great things that was born out of necessity, right? Because it's like William Hartnell, who was the first doctor, his health was kind of failing down the stretch of his run. And they're like, but the show's still really popular. What do we do? So we made up this thing that the doctor can regenerate into another person. And basically it's like a lot of stuff I love where it's like out of desperation, they created something that could keep the show running forever without yeah. just sort of out of like, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, he can regenerate? Is that a thing? Maybe that's a thing, you know? And they've iterated it even still on that concept to the point where, well, we'll talk about it when we get to the giggle. Um, yeah. But like they're continuing to iterate on that yeah. particular uh, narrative well, mechanism. Like um, a lot of sci-fi for good or for stuff. Ill. Like a lot of sci-fi stuff, once you open a door, it's you know sort of like okay, well then, then can we open it this much more? And it's sort of like, mm -hmm. what else can we do? Um, and so it's an interesting thing. So what I'm saying is that there is almost inherently in the design of the show because of these regenerations through the main actors, there's always sort of a softish reboot, right? Every time yeah. you change doctors, even though the continuity is still going. Like, that's one of the things that was so crazy about when Russell T. Davies did his reboot, as we're talking about. He didn't really reboot anything. He was just like, oh, no, the, 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 it's just, it just it's come back, you know? It, and, and over yeah. time, and especially when we get to the giggle, really diving deep into the history of the Doctor, um, you know, all of it counts. And I think that's one of the most fun things to me about it is... Uh, and, and we should say, I don't know how much classic Who you've watched. I've dabbled here and there. Um, some of it is hard to track down. Some of it yeah. doesn't. Some of it maybe doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, it's an interesting thing. So it's it's tough in some ways to go back to it. Um, but it you know, also I, a lot of it watches like black box theater. Yeah, you definitely like have to go in knowing. It's a little bit. It's 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 more of a more of a commitment than, but it's a little bit like going back to the original Star Trek, and you have to put on the mind, you have to put on the goggles of like, okay, they have the resources they have in this time period, right? It's yeah. not going to look like now. Even going back to, like, whenever you see clips of like Eccleston or early David Tennant compared to now, that looks like garbage compared to these look, like these specials are just like wow, look how far Doctor Who's come. What's interesting specifically with the comparison to Doctor Who and Star Trek, though, is with Star Trek, you have something like Strange New Worlds that we talked at length about before being yeah. this modernization of the old aesthetic to mm -hmm. make it l still look like sci-fi and futuristic and sort of like move past the constraints that that original show had. Right. Whereas Doctor Who is always got like it, they can improve the look of things and certain like aesthetics and CGI. But at, at the end of the day, there's still going to be some doofy looking guys in rubber suits every once in a while. And there, there's there are, a sort of charm to that. There are commitments to certain aesthetics and stuff like that. Right. That like take like the Daleks, for example, where you're like, they've polished them up. But it's you can still see the whisk and the plunger. You know what I mean? Like it's still like a trash can with a whisk and a plunger attached to it. it. It's been molded into this thing now, but like baked into the very aesthetic of this thing. Just like the idea that he goes around in a spinning police box, right? Like I mean, like there's there's also a Britishness to it. I think that's part of it, right? It's like there's a whimsy to it that isn't present in Star Wars or Star Trek. Take the first episode of these three specials we're talking about, the Star Beast. Star we Beast, have yeah. this conceit of these like warring alien factions breaking out onto the streets of London, and the Doctor mm -hmm. and his human friends kind of thrown in the middle of that. Yeah, one of those is one of the most like beautifully executed puppet CGI hybrids I've seen on television in the form of the Meep. Like that looked phenomenal. The meep is great, yeah. And then you have the 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 Rarth, what are they called? Oh um, yeah. That are just guys in big bug suits that look like they could have been from like 
the day the earth stood still or something. <laughs> well, they, they maintain within it. There's also that sort of thing, right? That it's like, you should bring a day there's is still. And this is something I, I, I bring up. Uh, that's a little bit, the, a little bit the case in Star Trek and a little bit more the case in Star Wars, but particularly Doctor Who is like, it's still born of like 60s sci-fi. Yes. It's still, th there's a goofiness to it. We've talked about that on our, because well, we regularly cover Star Wars on the show, of course. And we talk about, like, there's always a baked-in 70s thing. Like, when you go to it, like, oh, well, Imperial guys are going to have, like, sideburns. And there's always going to be, like, a little bit of that 70s discotheque kind of thing to the costumes and stuff like that, right? Like, there's, you know, there's Han a, Solo is always going to be a swinging 70s guy to some extent. There's a certain retrofuturism built in. And I think that's less the case in Star Trek a lot of the time. Well, because Star Trek is, of all of these we're talking about, the most like future casting where it's like, no, this is this is futurism from right now, you know. Yeah. And so each thing sort of has its, you know, uh, next generation feels very 1980s vision of Star Trek. But then Star Trek Picard, which is the same characters, uh, uh, continue to grow with the things. And now it feels like 2020s vision of the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does always feel like, and even like we talked about with Strange New Worlds, which is borrowing some of the aesthetic, but it's still much more like filtered through the lens of that. Whereas I think Star Wars has a little bit of that 70s thing. And then Doctor Who is very much still doing, you know, saucer men from Mars. Kind of yeah. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Like, yeah, that's sort of the thing, pulp space opera sort of stuff. I mean, it's very interesting, actually. I don't know if you I kind of saw this, but the Star Beast is actually an adaptation of a uh, Doctor Who comic from the 1980s. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's based on, because um, Dave Gibbons gets a story by credit, who's, uh, mm. of course, the, you know, the artist of uh, of uh, Watchmen, but he did that Doctor Who comic, and they, they which is kind of a cool thing. And I actually, I'm, it's one of those things where I'm going like, man, when you're making as much as this, why wouldn't you start rating the comics for story ideas? That oh. makes a lot of sense. The or the novels books too, the, yeah. There's as radio plays. The, the, there's so much of that crap. So much of the uh, the uh, audio dramas. I mean, my God, that's like a whole separate thing. Doctor Who and the Star Beast. Uh, this was a uh, uh, let's see. This was published in 1980. Oh, okay. Three three issue miniseries from February to April of 1980. Doctor Who and the Star Beast. Now this was. Uh, uh, a Tom Baker adventure in the comics. Mm, okay. Yeah. Same I mean, basic and, and, plot though. Uh, yes. Essentially, the idea of of uh, except in the comics, it's beep the meep. Sure. And I'm <laughs> like, I'm assuming all the like noble family stuff isn't there. Obviously. No, no, no. Because it's all um, it's all in uh, uh like I said, it's yeah. all uh Tom Baker. So it's it's Tom. It's the Fourth Doctor and K Nine. You know, and Sarah uh, like, Jane's uh, probably kicking around. Uh, uh, no, it's his. Uh, it's his other one. Oh, it's yeah. a different. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I if you're like an a uh, a uh, a long time um, Whovian, I, I'm sorry, I'm not super well versed in these characters. Like in the in the giggle when they bring back Melanie, the six six and seven Doctor's companion, I'm like, oh yeah. I think I've seen you. So here's how I tend to absorb the older Who stuff is something would come up as a reference point in the yeah. new Who, at which point I would go back and via yes. like researching online, finding old episodes where I can. That is when I would absorb those older moments and bits. Yes. That's kind of how I feel like. Because of the giggle, I'm going like, I need to go back and watch the Toymaker episodes from William Hartnell. <laughs> especially now, you do now. yeah. Well, especially now they know he's played by Michael Goth, who was Alfred in the, the Tim mm -hmm. Burton Batman movies, which I'm like, ooh, I love Michael Goth. <laughs> um, I, I have no idea what the take on that is. We'll get to the giggle, obviously, when we get to it, but like, uh, I don't know what that take on one is, but I'm guessing different because this feels so tailor made for one Neil Patrick Harris. NPH, NPH is all over that third. It, it might be the it might be the most NPH. It's not, I'm not saying it's the best NPH performance. I'm saying it's the most NPH performance. 
when he invades unit headquarters, yeah. my girlfriend turns to me and says, are we eating an NPH dance number? Because that is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's wonderful. It's so good. Uh, and he <laughs> is having the time of his life in it. Yeah, of course. He He's is. having way too much fun. Criminal uh, amounts of fun. But well, let's let's yeah. go back and start with the Star Beast though, because I do want to talk about this special. The Star as, Beast, like is... the declaration of purpose for Russell T Davies because, coming back. It feels like yeah, we kind of got off the track of like a lot of people, including myself, were really disappointed by the Chris Chibnall seasons. And the thing that's the biggest bummer to me is I know Jodie Whittaker will take the blame for that, and it's not her fault at all. She's very she's a very talented actress. There are moments in there where I can absolutely see what an amazing doctor she would have been, but the writing just consistently let her down in those seasons. Mm. And also, you could feel they didn't have a take on the show because the show changes pretty radically from season to season in this way of going like, oh, people didn't like what we did. Well, let's do this now. And then it it ends up being... It doesn't... One of the things I think Dave, both Davies and Moffat had, Moffat more put it out front... But Davies also had this is there was a real sense of they knew what they were doing. There was a real sense of and even now it's so interesting. Davies coming back. He goes, well, I've, I've got the three seasons of this doctor like figured out. Boom, boom, boom. At least like the touchstones of where each sort of the milestones are. Mm-hmm. And Chibnall's big thing. And this is, you know, I, I get it. Uh, he was coming off of the heat of running Broadchurch. Also a David. All roads lead back to David Tennant, I think, at the BBC, <laughs> by the way. Um, but uh and that's where Jodie Whittaker also was in that show too. But uh, so, but um, he his big thing was he goes I don't want to do the things everybody else is doing. And so his first one of the first things he said when when he took over the show was he goes We're not doing any of the classic villains. No Daleks. No Cybermen. None of that shit. And people were like, Well, that's not the best attitude to introduce yourself to the fans with. And then his other big thing was and no Christmas specials. No, we're not doing the Christmas specials anymore. And look, I can give or take a special that is like specifically the doctor figures out the true meaning of Christmas. We've had sure. a few of those. We It's not necessary. Yeah. But like Die Hard, setting it at Christmas mm. is not the worst idea in the world. No, it's but and like I said, there was just there was there, there felt like there was this thing about like, we're going to try to I'm going to try to fix a thing that's not broken. And it's it it's was, sort of and, what and turned was, me off the first Jodie Whittaker season. Yeah. Is that it seemed like it was becoming this like I don't want to say kids show. That sounds way too reductive. Well, no, but there was also that was another big thing was his like he really wanted to put the emphasis more on we're gonna teach history. We're gonna, you know, really Yeah, there was a there was a I uh, yeah, I'm trying to I'm also trying not to like I almost said dumbing down. That's not quite... But there was a simplifying of it, right? There was... I don't know. It didn't... It And the big thing was... he A big thing people brought up is he did not hire people with sci-fi backgrounds. Not just... He didn't come from a sci-fi background. The writing staff didn't have a lot of science fiction experience. Which doesn't mean you can't write science fiction. Sure. But I think it's more indicative in the whole that he seemed to specifically choose a staff of people who didn't come from science fiction. And that's interesting. I'm going to draw a broad comparison, and it may be (laughs) reductive, it may be insulting, but this is how it sort of felt like to me. So you have a a movie of something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Then you have your novelization. Yes. Which can sometimes enhance the quality of the the movie that originally existed, or sometimes it can sort of like strip it down and be a shameless tie-in. That is yes. what it is. Below that, and I say again, even saying below, but like the next iteration is the junior novelization, right? Yeah. So that is yeah. a, a thing that I don't even know if they do these anymore, but it was definitely a thing when we were coming up in movies. Oh, God, yeah. I had a bunch was, of these. As a kid. They would have novelizations of movies that had like, it stripped down and simplified to a way that could be translated to quote unquote younger audiences, whatever. That right. Means. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
That's the Jody Whitaker that. seasons felt yeah. felt like the junior novelizations of Doctor Who to me. So like I fell off. I ha- I'm going to be perfectly honest. Haven't watched the last three seasons of Doctor Who because I got into I think the Rosa Parks episodes of the uh, of the eleventh season. And I was just like, I think I'm checking out here, y'all. That's, I think a lot of people bring up them checking out with that one. Because actually, I think her first episode, the first Jodie Whittaker was just not bad. Um, And then the Rosa Parks one was like, uh uh-oh. And then by the time you get into like the one with Chris Noth is the Trump allegory. You know, and it just, I, uh, I, I, I. I have watched all of it. I still am. Um, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. Maybe I'm just. A, but I, I did watch all of her seasons. Um, and also, I took it on the thing about like, okay, well, this time they're gonna get it together. And then her last season, um, which was called Doctor Who Flux, the whole idea being that it's all gonna be one story. Mm. It still wasn't very good. And he did. I'm not as mad as some people about because. The other thing is, we know continuity is ever shifting. Backstories yeah. are ever getting at con. So the idea that like Chibnall introduces this entire thing about like, oh, actually Hartnell isn't the first incarnation of the Doctor, and the Doctor was not even a Time Lord, but like this other being that could regenerate and was experimented upon. I don't like that storyline, but I don't give a shit either. At the same, you know, I mean, like I guess what I'm saying is like. Uh, and Russell T. Davies has taken a, a response. <laughs> There's a line in the giggle that's his rejoinder to that. And the toy maker has a line saying, I went back and made a puzzle of your life. Mm-hmm. And Russell T. Davies has said, he goes, that right there is, he goes, I would never erase somebody else's work. But he said, that is telling you you can take or leave what parts of continuity have been established. So he goes, I, I don't want to take it from those who did like that stuff. That could still be the case. But what I'm just introducing is like, maybe it's not. And this idea of this omnipotent bad guy who can futz with history gives you a big, wide swing and barn door of just like, yeah. take it or leave it. Yeah. And I think that's the, and the thing is because there's 60 years, there's stuff that contradicts itself all the time. You can't oh, yeah. put all this together to make the biography of the doctor. My God, it would be insane. Plus you add in the comics and the novels and the audiobooks and what's canon. And I haven't listened to it, but you know, Eccleston just came back and did his first audio adventure, which I I'm, saw I, I do want, recently. Yeah. I do want to hear because he, of course, he seems to have made a lot of peace. He's been out promoting the new seasons as well. And I'm going like, wow, that guy's come a long way. What what I think has happened is he has made peace with the character and its place in pop culture. I think he probably still holds some grudges against the production team that drove sure. him out of the show. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. I think that may be the case as well. But he seems to like have he, a, he, him and Russell T. Davies really did not get along. Well, the the, the we're, well, I swear we're going to get to these specials, but the history of Doctor Who is so interesting. Uh, the, the the time when his first episode aired, they had already announced he was leaving. Yeah, it was it was an instant thing. David Tennant has a story about going over to Russell because he and Russell D. Davis had done another show together, and so they knew each other. And he said, "Do you want to come over and see the first couple Doctor Who's?" And they'd only finished like three episodes. And then he showed him, he goes, would you like to be the doctor? He goes, what do you mean, isn't that guy the doctor? He's like, that guy's not sticking around. And so, like, they had, they already had David Tennant in place a couple episodes into filming that Eccleston season. There was already trouble, and they he had him in his back pocket as Tennant. Um, uh, you know, and it's it's a shame, because Eccleston... I look at Eccleston as the Timothy Dalton of uh, Doctor Who. <laughs> right, where it's like, I, he's great. I just, I, he didn't, he didn't just, he didn't get up to running speed yet, right? Like, it's just sort of like, so that's why he's always sort of this thing about like, well, he just kind of got cut off. So, um, if, and if, I guess if that's the case, then Paul McGann is the George Lazenby of, uh, oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. If he just got the one, uh, TV special and you're like, oh, he could have been good if you had given him a hell of a lot more time. Um, <laughs> so let's get to this. The big thing here is, yes, uh, a, a lot of people feel like, and I think it's it's almost impossible to deny this, that the return of Russell T. Davies and the surprise ending of Jodie Whittaker's season when she regenerated into David Tennant was a distinct, sorry about that, can we get this thing back on track? Because not you only do we get back, back... You bring back f- who is... 
he's the, the fan favorite. The fan favorite, right? He's the he's our generation's Tom Baker, right? Like sort of the the platonic ideal of the doctor, I feel like. The people's doctor, if you will. Recently, there have been a lot of Magic the Gathering crossover sets yeah. in which they've been crossing over with other big uh, franchise IPs. Doctor Who is a recent one where they released a bunch of decks all themed around Doctor Who stuff. And the way they split it up was they had a deck for the bad guys, a deck for all the old doctors. So like one through eight all had their own deck. Okay. Uh, um, they had David Tennant and or uh, Eccleston and David Tennant and Matt Smith as their own deck, and uh -huh. Jody Whittaker and um, Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi as uh, yeah. their own deck. Magic does this weird thing where Wizards of the Coast doesn't enforce MSRP on their products so that stores mm. can mark up products as demand increases so that like uh, game stores can make more revenue that way, in theory. Yeah. yeah. I say all of this is background to tell you that when the David Tennant deck was selling for $20 more than any other one regularly, there's yeah. a reason for that. No, there's the, the, he just, there's something about him as that character. Like I said, he's my favorite because there's just like, well, that's the doctor and everybody's played their thing, but there is something about like, I guess, yeah, once again, I come back to like platonic ideal. If you're going to boil it down, you know, to older people, that's Tom Baker, which I totally mm -hmm. get. And Tom Baker played in the longest. Nobody else is going to do seven seasons as the doc. You know, he's... Tom Baker is your your like Connery Bond, right? Like right. where it's just sort of like uh, that. That's the thing. But there's no question that yeah, David Tennant has become the one, and also he's the one too who seems to love doing it the most. Not that Eccleston's kind of the only one who really ever like scoffed at it, but it also seems like David Tennant is also. I mean, the, he's the one they brought back for the fiftieth, and now really brought him back for the sixtieth. And also, spoilers abound for this. Now have him in their back pocket to bring him back whenever they want. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just FYI, we're going to be spoiling the crap out of these three. Yeah. We already have a little bit. Um, yeah. But we have. But, like, yeah, there, there's there's now... Because I, I, I had a thought watching these. When the first one... When watching the Star Beast, I'm going, God, he's so good. And I'm, I'm so curious about this new guy who I hadn't seen at that point, of course. But I'm going, like, but if there was just some way he could be the Doctor forever... And then I get to the end of that, and I'm going, oh, my God, Russell T. Davies somehow <laughs> found a way to make him the Doctor forever. Whether we see him or not, mm -hmm. There is they, they basically are just like, don't you worry, David Tennant is always having adventures in time and space, kids. Well, and we already sort of opened that door when, during the 50th, we had Tom Baker back as yes. uh, the, the curator oh. show up and give us a sly little wink of like, and maybe we'll see some old faces again sometime. Wink, wink. Yeah, you'll find yourself revisiting some old faces. And I think he has, I think there's some line about like, only your favorite ones. <laughs> and you're like, I mean, and there's look, stuff about like Capaldi, they do it later acknowledge that he looks like the guy from Pompeii that Peter Capaldi played during the David yeah. Tennant episode. Man. Did I wish for like a 60th anniversary thing we could get all of the new who doctors in the same yeah. place at the same time. Yeah, of course I want that. Well, sure. I mean, I'm a little collector nerd and I want that image of all of them on the screen together. Which the 50th did give us that great CGI created shot where they literally had every doctor assembled side by side. Yeah. And we even got that last shot of just Capaldi's eyebrows at the end. That's the best. No, sir. <laughs> all 13 of them. Um, it's the best. It's like, yes! <laughs> um, but here, the, but but I also applaud Russell T. Davies for going. I'm going to do something different with this anniversary because yeah. the the gathering of doctors has been the case going back to the you know the 60s, right? Like when they would right. do the anniversary of used to be called things like the three doctors, the five doctors. That was like a thing. Mm -hmm. Every few years they would get together all the doctors who had done it before, uh, and it used to be you could get them all because there were only a few and they were all still alive. Um, yeah, but, but like uh, you could very easily, I mean, barring uh, personal uh, stakes in the matter, get everyone 
except for maybe Eccleston, in the same room yeah. at the same time. Because all the new Who doctors are still around mm-hmm. and kicking. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. You you definitely could. Um, and they, get McGann they in there, too. He needs some work. Hey, man, I love that little short they did that finally gave him his regeneration into the War Doctor that they did for mm. the 50th. Mm. I thought that was so cool because it was always like, no, wait, we never got how you get from McGann to Eccleston. Uh, and then, of course, the whole idea is you have a John Hurt stop in between. Yeah. <laughs> but so now we have now we have this thing starts with coming off of the end of the Flux miniseries uh, mm-hmm. was uh, Jody Whittaker turning into David Tennant, who is now David Tennant is now both the tenth and fourteenth Doctor. Sure, he is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the, yeah. I know, I know, but like the fact that we're returning to a companion from the tenth and dealing with aftermath of the tenth, while also dealing with aftermath of the thirteenth, it's just like it's timey wimey nonsense. It's Doctor Who at its best. No one in the show is ever going to call him the fourteenth Doctor, but that's fine. But it makes uh, Shui Gatwa the uh, the 15th Doctor, technically. Yes. Is that how you say his name? Shuti is how Shuti. I've heard it pronounced. Shuti okay. Gatwa. Okay. Um, who, and, and they did still find a way to get us two Doctors in here in this special. So yep. uh, in this last special, which I did appreciate. And I thought they were fantastic together. We'll get to him, though, because I want to, of course, save the 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 talk about for the future let's talk about these though i the thing i love about the star beast of course is classic sci-fi thing seems cute but is actually evil right Right. and the minute you see the meep you're just like okay so this thing's just the devil right well and it's so because it's so just like i'm the meep right you're just like uh (laughs) a little much buddy (laughs) the meep's laying it on a little thick <laughs> uh, about the design of the thing is so cool too because it is. It's got these big eyes. It's designed to be a plush toy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it even hides itself as a plush toy in one scene with Donna's daughter. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but what I like is they, they it just little subtle changes to it when it turns into its evil form. You're like, oh fuck! <laughs> but it's <laughs> yeah. still like the same basic design. It's very cool how they can take something cute and just twist it a little bit to suddenly be sinister. And great, I want to I want to shout out whoever did the voice on that because the voice performance is fantastic. The, um, the, the, um, God damn it! I gotta find these IMDb. How they catalog S- these? Cecily so Faye did the puppetry for it. Uh, okay, which great job there, uh, Miriam Margoyles. Oh wow. Okay. Classic uh, British actor. She's been around forever. Yeah, it's uh, great. People would probably know her best as Professor Sprout from the Harry Potter movies. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, look, if you were if if you were a British actor who wasn't in the weird, we've talked before about the lost generation of British actors. Too uh, was it uh, too old to be students, too young to be professors? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that uh, that appa- apparently they get together. Those guys and commiserate. <laughs> your Tom Hardy, your James McAvoy, your Michael Fassbender's. Uh, they always talk about how Tennant snuck in. Mm, and it's yeah, found yeah. the one loophole. <laughs> and then Redmayne cheated by doing Fantastic Beasts. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, no, I thought that was great, though. Because once again, the turn from like, I meep to I will destroy everything. <laughs> is once again, it's still in the same vocal register, but just suddenly turned a little bit. And it's like, oh, God, kill that thing. Send it to hell. <laughs> <laughs> as it threatens to uh, sink London into a volcano. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> that is one of those uh, total Doctor Who things, by the way, when it's like literally like the streets are turning to lava, and that's just fine. <laughs> when at the end, it's literally just like the streets resealing themselves, and I say yeah. like, oh, that's very nice of that starship to repave the roads. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh, there you go. It's all right. Yeah, it's, it's fine. fine. Yeah, everything's all right now. Don't worry. Don't worry, kids. Everything's all right. It's fine. (laughs) It's, no, don't worry about it. Okay, it's cool. Uh, Uh, But yeah, this special also marks the return of Catherine Tate as Donna Noble. That uh, was a big fan favorite companion. Fan favorite companion. And and certainly the, that felt the most like, because that was the final companion for Russell T. Davies run. Mm -hmm. And it really, that felt the most like, not only am I bringing David Tennant back, but bringing Catherine Tate back as Donna really had this feeling of like, uh, oh, Russell D. Davis is going, where did I leave off? Let's see. 
see. I'm back. All right. I'm just going to pick up. Not, I mean, yes, pick up the seeds of everything Moffat and Chibnall did, but really just kind of turn it back to when I last ran the show. I find it interesting that, so in the in the giggle, we have the toy maker kind of running down the grim fates of many of the companions yeah. uh, since Donna. Great and Great scene, by the way. Love that scene. And, it felt uh, like a purposeful dig from Davies to Moffat to not <laughs> mention Martha at all. Even, like, why wasn't Martha... Because she was... Was she before... She's a Davies companion. Yeah, then where is she at in that? Because is she, well, she before or after track. Martha? Mar- Martha, it's it goes Rose, Martha, Donna. Then Amy, Clara, oh. Bill. I get confused because the runaway bride thing happens uh, yeah, before she, Martha shows up. He, he, that That's a weird one. Yes, that's a weird one because they did the special with Catherine Tate. Mm-hmm. Then they do the Martha season. Then Catherine Tate comes back in the Adipose episode because you have that yes. great scene where she recognizes him. Yes. Um, also, the other thing is these two work together a lot, David Tennant and Catherine Tate, not just in Doctor Who. And you can really feel that because their chemistry is instant the second they're in a scene together there's just that that impossible to to fake thing right that those two just crackle together mm-hmm. uh they yeah. really played i the I, I recommend once again if you're any level of shakespeare fan go watch their they there's a film version of their uh their uh take on much ado about nothing that is just mm. absolute goddamn delight with those two uh they're fantastic <laughs> in it um, believe it or not, but, those two are very, very charming. But when we last yeah. left Donna Noble, she had sort of like the tragic need to walk away from the doctor ending that a lot of companions get, where yeah. she has this whole setup where if she ever, she has her memory erased, and if she ever remembers the doctor, she'll die. Yeah, she basically, I mean, it's, it's this crazy sci-fi thing that I'm about to say, but like, she basically like absorbs the entirety of the knowledge of Gallifrey, right? Like, that's the thing where it's like, mm-hmm. she is she is all time lords at the same time, and the only and and that level of knowledge in a human being will just destroy them. So, yes, her memory is erased, and if she's ever reminded of the Doctor, then that will come back and she'll die. Yeah, and and it's this... a, it's a classic. Never forget how fucking sad Doctor Who is. Um, oh, Doctor Who is always the saddest. It's um, so sad. Yeah, even when he gets a happy ending in which he, David Tennant, technically gets to have a happily ever after with Rose. It's not yep. the David Tennant we keep following. Oh, God, that's such a good... That was... that was. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I I am reminded, once again, watching this, it's just like, God damn, Davy so gets the vibe of Doctor Who. And watching mm-hmm. these again, it is that thing about, like, well, what... I know, Sometimes I can't even fully put my finger on it. I think you're getting close with that junior novelization comparison. But there is something about, like, what is Davies doing that Chibnall wasn't doing? That, like, Davies and Moffat got at something in different ways. But Davies gets that. That he really just gets the character and, and the world of Doctor Who, right, I think. Mm-hmm. And that, that ending is so perfect where it was just like, oh, no, I, no, I gave the Doctor a happy ending. It's just not, it's not your Doctor. Yeah. You're going to keep following the sad Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> because he is always the lonely god, right? That sort of thing, right? Is always is just this this guy who can't who loves humanity so much but can't ever be part of it. Well, and that's why I found the ending of the giggle so interesting and how that's sort of a refutation of that in a certain way and how what the 15th doctor might bring if you sort of resolved some of those issues. He he gets he gets to have it he gets to have his cake and eat it too right he gets yeah. to be a retired guy while also the world still gets the universe as, as it were of all of time and space still has the doctor to protect it and I, a what lot of people f- talk about is is Shudi Gatwa's doctor going to be considerably different is he freed of some right. of the emotional baggage of the other doctors is in some ways this a clean slate I think that's the way it's being written as. Uh, I mean, just based on... Uh, did you see that you saw the trailer for his Christmas special? The uh, start the um, no, I have not. There's So there's this thing where he's like in a club and he's dancing with his arms out like free. And it's sort of like, oh yeah, this is 
this is maybe going to be a freer doctor, of course, as we know, of Dr. Free to gain more emotional baggage as his stories oh, go along. Yeah, of course. But, <laughs> but it does it almost just... feel like the beginning of that trailer where he's sort of dancing in this club blissfully with his arms wide open. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense coming off of the end of this. Here's a guy who's just like, hey, man, I'm the doctor, and it is great to be the doctor. <laughs> and even the way he shows up. Bring on that, the emotional trauma. Yeah, man, it's only going to get worse from here. Um, How many well, space devils do I need to talk to this year? But the other thing I liked about, uh, so cause, uh, talking about, because it's, it's very tempting to jump to the end of that, obviously. Uh, it's from the Star Beast to, uh, is it the Wild Blue Yonder? Is the... uh, yeah, I do want to stick to the Star Beast really quickly because I want to get your take on what do you think of the resolving the whole oh. Donna, like she might, she would die if she ever remembered re Doctor Ending. They basically I... like get rid of it. I like, well, I mean, it was that was always going to happen, right? Like, sure. I, I don't, yeah. it's so interesting. I've seen a lot of people just go like undoing one of the great things, but he undoes it in a very Doctor Who way, which is Doctor Who is is a is a show about an alien. Right, who basically always is marveling at humanity, though, right? Like, that's the whole thing. And so, the idea that the resolution is you share this power with your offspring mm. is so purely Doctor Who to me, right? Like, it's yeah. this idea about like together we can, you know, weather this thing, we can handle this. And that's so much about the... Because th there's also the whole running thing, and this was a big part of Davies' run, where it's like the Doctor shouldn't be alone. The Doctor gets very dark and starts becoming that god figure if he's not balanced by a human companion. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, that's that... Th there's always this thing about community and family and, you know, uh, empathy in Doc that's key to Doctor Who. So... He was always going to resolve the 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 idea that the idea because it's like what they were make three specials and Donna wasn't gonna they weren't gonna have to reckon with that um, <laughs> and so but I thought he did it in a very smart way that didn't feel like it was just like well it's undone now yeah in the same way that like the pavement is resealed uh, when the alien ship is turned off right no it's like it's like there are actual things it's like well okay because it the other thing that's great about it being the the daughter is. It's not a thing that was just like, why didn't they just do this before then? Because she wasn't around, yeah. right? It's sort of like a thing that, that's happened. But what I really liked about it is that it gave us this in in the second special, Wild Blue Yonder, yeah. where Donna can have this like level of empathy for the Doctor yeah. now that she didn't before, that I She's found really seen... interesting. She's seen the world the way he sees it to a certain extent, right? Yeah. She's contained all that knowledge within her. Um, it's one of my favorite moments in any comic ever is in All-Star Superman when mm. Lex Luthor gets Superman's abilities briefly and he's like, oh my God, I get it. When I'm seeing the world on like a molecular level, holy shit. I'm, and he's basically just like, I am so sorry I treated you this way because the burden of this is incredible uh and so i do like that as, as well yeah where it's like oh now she sees what what it is to be a time lord mm -hmm. in this sort of eternal because i mean that, that that's it it's the inherent tragedy of any immortal character right is always that people around you will live and you won't you know well, the, the, the die and you won't and you're eternal Especially, and something that they starts in Wild Blue Yonder, but is really driven home in the giggle, is this idea that since the Time War, which is like the big MacGuffin of an event that happens in between yeah. Old Who and New Who. Yes. Uh, that has been touched on countless times, and we got a whole 50th anniversary special kind of explaining the Doctor's role in it as the guy who made the hard choice to, like, kill both sides, basically, to stop the war. I mean, the, never forget the doctor did make the logical jump to genocide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, and and it weighs on him. He didn't do it lightly. Um, no. But then got to kind of go back and and not undo it per se, but like find another option that's sort of a because like Gallif the whole thing about Gallifrey stands and stuff like that is like yeah, but it's also trapped in time forever. So it's sort of like a this is. <laughs> It's a, it was a compromise still. Yeah. 
yeah, there was no good way out of it because, look, Time Lords are fucking awful on the Yeah, whole. I mean, there's one of the things <laughs> I love about Doctor Who is that it comes down to, like, I think he's the only actually good Time Lord. Because when we get him with um, oh, Timothy Dalton in the end of time, which is fucking mm-hmm. great, of course, uh, speaking of James Bond. Um, but, uh, th- yeah, there's, there's definitely this thing about, like, the Doctor's kind of the only Time Lord who, like, has humanity. Well, Which makes the sense only why he's, drawn to, why he's drawn to humanity so much. The only other one that we've had any significant amount of time with the is master. the master. <laughs> yeah, the fucking worst ever. And yeah. I will say is one of the th- one of the because I was shitting on the Chibnall seasons, which deserve it in my opinion. But their master is very good. I, that's the mm-hmm. only thing I will say is the because uh, it was the same guy who played um, uh, the villain in Iron Fist it was a Steel Serpent. Mm hmm. That guy's fucking great. And he cool. was a great master. There's a couple good episodes in there. I'm not going to say the whole thing is like garbage, but it generally doesn't work. But there are there are a few good episodes, and I like that two-parter with the master. Um, it definitely seems like we might get a return of Missy based on well, the, uh, as we shot should. we get at the end of the, the giggle. I love Michelle Gomez so much as that character. Yeah. Um, she's wonderful. So I am always on board for more of her. Um, but yeah, uh, so the Star Beast, I, I, I thought they did a really good job of resetting, uh, Davy's stuff. And it also feels like, and, and they kind of even allude to this, right? Sort of like, why come back as the 10th Doctor if not to resolve that, right? Like, it's yeah. sort of like David Tennant's Doctor returned because there was unfinished business for that character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, and they drive that point home in, Wild Blue Yonder and the Giggle in a big way. Let's talk about Wild Blue Yonder a little bit. Wild I Blue like Yonder. that it is sort of just a bottle episode. I like this a bottle episode, and it's it's it's, it's a weird Doctor Who episode, right? Like I yeah. feel like with each of these, you get sort of the like cute slash creepy alien episode. You get the big super villain episode in three, and then this is like the weird little bottle episode one. That's just like bizarre. And kind of creepy. I mean, Doctor Who also, that's the thing. It's like, the two things I always point out is like, don't forget, like, Doctor Who's whimsical and fun stuff. But it's also sad and it's also scary. Yeah. Uh, One of the episodes that people point to as like, okay, take your barometer on Doctor Who by this is Don't Blink, right? The the first Weeping Angels episode. And it's weird to point people to that episode in abstract because it is an episode that ostensibly barely has the doctor in it there's a couple things like this because the other one i always think of uh people bring up star trek with city on the edge of forever which is the time travel one and mm. people always bring that it's the show talk about the same way they talk about the, the blink episode and uh uh and i'm always just like well these are like two of the best examples two of the best entries in these shows but both are really very different and don't capture the like aesthetics of the show but yes uh, by the way, the Blink, uh, of course, being a, a, um, a Stephen Moffat script. Yep. Because uh, that's the thing is, <laughs> even during the Russell T. Davies, if you look at, if I was to list my favorite episodes, they're all the Moffat written ones. Silence in the Library <laughs> is also one I fucking love. Uh, Girl in the Fireplace. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's all, yeah, it's like Moffat just, I, I, I think I'm most, I'm just in sync with his vision of what can be done in this setting and world and stuff like that so um because that's the other thing is well i think that's another thing too right is from davies to moffat moffat was already a major creative hand so i do think that's why you see a huge difference when you go to chibnall because now he's just an outside force whether you like what he did or not but it makes sense that like moffat and davies were working together so the switch from moffat to davies is sort of like a slight calculation right there's a smoother handoff there because yeah moffat was already so entrenched in Doctor Who that his voice already existed in the chorus that created yeah. the show. It didn't feel like, whoa, this is a complete live show. You're like, oh no, it's like leaning into this flavor that was already there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Chibnall is just like, I'm doing something completely different. And I think regardless of whether it worked for you or not, there is a distinct like, whoa, okay. This yeah. is a different show. Um, but Wild no, yeah, Yonder I, definitely feels like a Moffat episode yes. in some ways where it's just like okay we're dealing with like 
abstract horror concepts that like once you actually think about suddenly you have all this existential dread you didn't know was there before there's always something inherently like primally upsetting about a doppelganger right looking at you that's not you is just disturbing and then to further add the like weird body horror of it of like and even physically it's not quite right and also get the arms right i (laughs) love my my arms too long the also the moment when you have donna and the doctor talking to each other they're like well this is weird they're in and then you realize they're both talking to the other one but across the spaceship from each other so cool so classic like i love when doctor who does stuff like that and it's there in its very clever sort of singular sci-fi concepts that are in each episode they can always do stuff like this like oh he me on that one yeah and uh and that's like singular creepy moments like trying to figure out the little mysteries of everything that's happening the the skeleton of the captain outside the ship and mm-hmm. like the whole idea that thinking faster makes these things better copies and that's the thing that the doctor does most that's also <laughs> so cool because we always expect him to think his way out of situation the doctor's great you know power is his mind right that it's always yeah. going to be he's always going to be the most clever way to get out of it and that's the fun of watching it it, it ha- i mean it makes sense to moffat also did sherlock because there's a similarity in that of sort of the celebration of the intellectual hero in these things um but so yeah the idea about like wait what if what if that can be turned against him um is really cool uh, and 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 then of course just all the doppelganger fun of the the boiling down this isn't literally the thing but like the which one do i shoot which one do i believe how do i know i'm talking to the real person um i love also the we talked about the arms but when the thing about like oh the thing i brushed off me that doesn't go away mm, when I he drops that. the tie yeah 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 i doesn't just go away it stays there uh, like it's yeah the they the, the figure way. out object permanence the other thing once again is what fun for david Tennant and Catherine tate to get to play their characters and then weird versions of their characters trying to act like them yeah that's a fun acting game just by itself well because that's the other thing too is they're basically the only two actors in that episode so uh thank god you have people as talented and charming as david Tennant and Catherine tate that they they can do that well don't forget uh mixed race Isaac Newton that made the internet go fucking oh, ballistic fuck for 24 who hours. Yeah, who cares? I know. No uh, cares. Yeah, I, I mean, I, Davies responded to that. Did you see him talk about that? No. Or he just goes like, he goes, uh, well, this is, uh, this is Doctor Who's version of history. And he goes, I'd like to think in the Doctor Who version of history, things are more diverse. So you know, it's, <laughs> he's basically going like, Doctor Who lives in a better world than us. Uh, I will. I do want to mention that actor who played Isaac Newton in that episode briefly, uh, Nathaniel Curtis, only Wonderful. because he is the lead voice in a uh, animated show on Netflix that I am going to highly recommend, and that is Captain Laserhawk. Uh, I have not heard of Captain Laserhawk. I love the Captain title. Captain Laserhawk. Uh, the the subtitle is a Blood Dragon remix. So if you ever played Far Cry Blood Dragon, this is a show that takes like the basic concepts of that and remixes it some. Um, oh, okay. Well, I need to watch this because I love so Blood yeah, Dragon. Nathaniel Curtis about- plays Captain Dolph Laserhawk. Oh, okay, okay. I do need to watch this. <laughs> um, here's the thing about Netflix. They make so much stuff that it's very easy for stuff to just like disappear. Yeah, it's a gonzo bonkers cyberpunk nightmare of a show, and I love it. I'm in. Oh, he was in uh, It's a Sin, which was Russell T. Da- which is a Russell T. Davies show, so that makes ah, sense. Okay. Yes. Okay, that makes a lot of. That was the show of Russell T. Davies. That was his most recent show, uh, which also had Neil Patrick Harris in it. Let us bring us straight to the giggle then, because uh, <laughs> like Wild Blue Yonder, there's a lot of fun stuff there, but it is a very simple, straightforward episode. It almost feels like it's it, it, it by having the three specials, he got to reset the, the 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 stage with his first one. He's he gets to to hand off to the what the the next part of Doctor Who is going to be the third one, and the second one is just Doctor Who fun. Like it's just yeah. like I just want to do that's like a mid season Doctor mm-hmm. Who bit of weirdness. Yep, um, it felt it very. It felt really good and natural, and just like okay, this doesn't need to be a part of a bigger story. You could watch Wild Blue Yonder as just a one-off, 
Doctor Who adventure. It doesn't matter. Could have happened 10 years ago. Yes, absolutely. And that was what was so fun. It was just nice to see David Tennant like in a, in a Doctor Who one-off. So then that gets yeah. us... Well, the end of Wild Blue Yonder, of course, has Donna and the Doctor returning to modern-day London, but everything's gone to hell. We do get one final appearance from Wilfred, which just filled me with joy. Yeah, Bernard Cribbins for his last performance at the end of that episode. And he was wonderful, as always. What a delightful character. Um, Yeah, and and, but that takes us into the world of chaos we find in the Giggle, though we open in the 1920s with the invention of television, which is (laughs) purely Doctor Who, right? Like, in... In television, the medium the Doctor exists in is hidden the secret of the mystery of this villain and why the world is going insane now. (laughs) So much fun. What do you think of Neil Patrick Harris as a character within Doctor Who? Is he too much... This is always a thing with like actors whose names have become synonymous with the characters they play, right? Like yeah. NPH sort of broke out of his Doogie Hauserness with yeah. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle by playing a insane version of himself. That that, that character is, that, then translates into Barney Stinson and How I Met Your Mother. That's like the turning point that then starts like the whole second half of his career. Right. Uh, and I remember him talking about that. I, I, I love that he was just like, because I had made peace with, I was just going to be Doogie forever and I can do Broadway. And that's like, that's my life. I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, but yeah, I, he has an, he has kind of a miraculous career because Doogie Hauser would be the end for most people. For yep. most actors, that would be it. Uh, it's mm-hmm. little that we know the man has um, a, a, an inhuman amount of talent, like the, the <laughs> equivalent talent of 10 people uh, and can do anything. Um, but you're talking about, is he uh, uh, too much of an icon? Is the potential that he's too much of an icon unto himself? Yeah. Does he overwhelm Doctor Who by simply being NPH? I would say not in how he's used here. Because okay. the character is overwhelming the character of the Doctor. I think it, 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 it's the perfect use of him. And also, he's a guy where it's one of those... Things where there are very few. I, I I was saying this to somebody. I'm going. He's one of the only people. He's one of the only American actors I could think of who could play the Doctor. In my opinion, mm, he actually fits so well in this world because they don't. It's not like they get a lot of American stars in Doctor that's, Who. That's not known for that. That's the other thing. Is just like this is one of the few instances I can think of where a highline American actor has shown up in a Doctor yeah. Who special or episode at all. Yeah, I can't think of hardly any that, that have ever done it. I mean, you know, like like a known person, because Barrowman's one of the few. And even Barrowman's a weird, like, UK-American, uh, yeah. you know, mutt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd appreciate that description. Oh, uh, well, I'm sure he'd say something cheeky. He's a delightful man. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, but I think that that's the thing about it is, and even in the show, like I said, he's the, when he's introduced with this insane German accent and then the, literally a character of the show is like, your accent's slipping. Like there's, I just, I thought he was so good in this. I love his, he can be creepy. I sort of love his late in career now transition into villain roles because, uh, those who he's very fucking creepy in, in David Fincher's Gone Girl. And uh, uh, Matrix and we, Resurrections. I was just gonna say Matrix Resurrections. We just saw him playing the new, you know, version of the Architect in that, yeah. um, which he was, I thought, was fantastic in. Um, I haven't watched his show Uncoupled. That's the new sitcom he does uh, over on Showtime. Um, but I'm sure I say still- only because I haven't seen it either. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're making a second season of that right now. So I'm, I'm that's that's one of those things on my very long list of shows I need to watch, uh, including the aforementioned "It's a Sin," the Russell T Davies show. <laughs> Two shows I have not seen that he's in, but uh, I loved him in this. I thought he was, and like I said, he's having so much fun, which so fits the toy maker who seems to be having so much fun being a supervillain. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, like that that's the thing is 
uh, only compared, I think, to, say, The Master have we usually gotten just straight-up monologuing supervillains in Doctor yeah. Who. And really, the toy maker different than the master. This one really feels like, oh, this is the Doctor's Joker. This is the guy who's chaos. I would actually compare him more to uh, Mr. Mitzelplek because he does have rules that he has to follow. I did when he was defeated. I also thought Mitzelplek because the way he goes out is a very Mitzelplek mm-hmm. uh, ending for him. He's literally folded up flat and put in a box. Um, yeah. and he, he was is, like, he you have to spell my name backwards character. away from being that character. God damn it. If Superman doesn't always get him to say his name backwards. It just, <laughs> it just every time, man, I don't know. You would think he's, and he's like, he's not going to do it. And then, yep, it was, that's the case. Uh, so I love this. I also love, we see a little bit of unit in, in um, Star Beast. We get a lot of unit in this and I love unit. Um, you love getting a lot of unit, John? Ah, uh, yes. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm comfortable with myself. Uh, okay, just making sure. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I Look, I, I love a lot of unit just as much as the next guy. Give me all the unit. Get it all up in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd say if I'd use that exact <laughs> wording, but hey, to each their own. Um, but, Why not, uh, John? I I would like an unlubricated amount of unit, just like as much as you can. I didn't see any lubrication around in this unit. Um, but uh, so, uh, Jesus Christ! Now, I, now, now you've completely thrown me. Off. Um, but uh, oh no! So yeah, oh, through unit we get uh, another character who's very popular with the assholes on YouTube. Uh, this is the uh, Shirley Bingham, the the wheelchair using uh, uh, scientist character. No, oh, no, she was no in the Star Beast as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we saw her, and now she's back in this. Uh, it's, along uh, with... Ruth Madeley is the yeah, actress. Yeah, I thought she was, she was delightful. I, I hope yeah. we see more of her in the in the coming season. Uh, and then Gemma Redgrave uh, back as Kate Lethbridge Stewart mm-hmm, uh, of mm-hmm. the legendary Redgrave acting dynasty. Um, uh, we also have a return of Bonnie Langford as uh, Melanie Bush, who, like you said, is a doctor's companion who, let's be honest, you and I are probably a little unfamiliar with, but is... Uh, seen her in images of those seasons. And maybe... Yes. Uh, maybe it's, as I said, I have, de- I have seen at least a smattering of each doctor, but I, I can't say that I've really... But yes, she was the sixth uh, a companion for the sixth and seventh doctor. So mm-hmm. Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy. Um, she's very charming in the, uh, you yeah, know, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, 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 by the way, go back and look at her hair because holy crap, the eighties did a number on her hair in those episodes. <laughs> well, um, look, the, the 80s of, did a, a number on a lot of people, but <laughs> well, I'll just say, go back and just look at what, those who aren't familiar with the sixth doctor. Just look at Colin Baker's outfit. Good Lord. Um, cocaine was a hell of a drug. We all know this. Even by Doctor Who standards, the Six Doctors outfit is a bit too much. Um, uh, was was he the one with the uh, the question mark cane? No, that's Sylvester McCoy. He's the one who has the 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 coat and suit that are all different patterns. It's like a rainbow ah, yeah, 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 yeah. and colors. Yeah. Um, no, the 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 question mark cane is awesome, and that is Sylvester McCoy, and I do like his outfit. Um, Sorry, but, but so only anyway. one character should have a question mark cane, and that's the Riddler. <laughs> Uh, Biggest problem I have with the Batman <laughs> is where's his question mark game. I'm hey, saying Brandon Jones is still wanting to know where the Penguin's umbrella is in that movie too. So um, equally important. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, the, we we get the toy maker who it, it's always so cool to do that classic thing of where you have the Doctor be like, oh God, I know what this is, and Wrong. suddenly, <laughs> yeah, when he's scared of it. Um, good lord. And yeah, th- th- there's something so fun always about the supervillain who loves being evil. Like this guy just yeah. loves what he does. Mm-hmm. He's just he's just such a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and you could almost write it off as oh, he doesn't understand what he's doing because he's just like this elemental concept of play. But he like is cute, reveling yeah. in a certain amount of uh devilishness when he's like turning people into puppets and like well, I, that the, the and it's very doctor because one thing that and this is you're talking about the idea of it being 
there's a level of uh there's like a weight to this that doesn't it's not a kid show that moment when he like turns a guy into into like colored balls and they're like what happened the dodge just goes he's dead like yeah. there's just it's not, it's not like a cute it's like that's like a whimsical way to dispatch a guy but the dodge being like i'm sorry those people are gone for good they are dead <laughs> they got turned into balls <laughs> Yeah, it's like this is not like a temporary thing. This is like no, that he's he's murdering people. Yeah. Um, cuz yes, we talked about his entrance into the the unit headquarters to a Spice Girls song. That was a little much, but I appreciated it. Well, cuz that once again, I like that because the toy makers a little much. Yeah. <laughs> and we get the the, cr- like the line four different costume changes with the toy maker. Oh yeah. The line between fun and evil on this guy, where it is like there's 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 a a, a, a murderous he's having homicidal fun, like yeah, he's enjoying it too much, which makes it all the creepier. Yeah, no, I mean the Joker comparison isn't not apt. No, it definitely like personality wise, he definitely has the Joker vibe to him. And once again, it's all about chaos. It's like I'm just gonna make everyone go mad. Yeah. Because his whole master plan is he's, he's embedded this like waveform into every single screen on the planet. And now that everyone is so deeply entrenched and connected, it has activated this thing that has been on broadcasts since broadcasts started. And it's making everyone believe that they are correct, which I think is such a good like yes. Doctor Who villain like destroy the world plan right we've mm-hmm. seen so many of those like you brought up the adipose earlier just like oh everyone obsessed with weight loss and like what if the weight you lost was the bad guy <laughs> that's something i think particularly davies run of, of who does because you also had the um speak when we were talking about the master when it was john sims master and the whole thing with the satellite networks was a similar thing right where it's like suddenly mm-hmm. it invoked this rage in people and things like that right where it's like yeah they're He's definitely a guy with his finger on the pulse. Russell T. Davis is an interesting writer because a lot of his other stuff is very pointedly political. So I think mm. it makes sense that he finds ways to get that into Doctor Who without it feeling as clumsily. I, I do think we talked about you talked about dipping out after that Rosa Parks episode, and I think that was an example of Chibnall trying to talk about something. But people also bring up tough when Doctor Who deals with American history just because it's so British but like that was another episode where it's like shame on you racism and you're like yes that is a bad thing but this is very clumsily written and I think yeah. that Davies finds a way to in, in, in a lot of the best science fiction it's one of the things I think both of us really respond to in the genre is when it's like oh you're talking about a thing without talking about it and it's something Roddenberry always talked about in Star Trek he goes I can be so much more upfront about stuff if I just make it an alien race. But I'm literally completely talking about Vietnam. And sure. it, and the yeah. network's going like, yeah, but it's a gleep glop. So no, it's not saying it's fine. It's like television producers have blinders in some way. Yeah. That like, okay, if we had a discussion about what makes trans people vibrant and, you know, just like uh people god forbid uh if you just said that out loud in a a show a producer would be like oh no too political though yeah i do find it interesting that that is basically how the star beast ends and they're not subtle about it at all Um, oh and and believe me some once again some people (laughs) oh yeah no and there are some assholes out there who are always going to get angry when you try to treat other people as people and not as the uh, political (laughs) caricatures that uh, certain media environments have taught them. To think. We, we talked about not wanting to get too much into this, but it's such an interesting thing that that that, that you bring that up because I, I, I saw know. somebody talking about this, and it wasn't even about Doctor Who specifically. It was just you know there are people just people doing jackass online, and they're talking about like these franchises. The big problem is they're trying to put in all this political messaging, and I was thinking like, you know. Far be it from me, but like I mean, like in the, the 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 fundamental breakdown between these their opinion and mine is, I don't think the presence of a black character or a trans character is a political message. Like just them being included in a plot, that's not a political statement. And and to them, they're like, whoa, these politics. It's like, 
Well, that's just a person who's a type of person who exists. Like they didn't. Yeah. There's, there's even the even the the trans character that is Donna's daughter. There's a couple lines about it, but it's it's not like the overwhelming point of that story by any means. Well, they do like really drive it home at the end of the episode when they say like, if she wasn't a trans woman, then maybe she wouldn't be able to encapsulate all the things that make up a time lord because they're not bound by the same rules of like gender yeah, dimorphism I mean, that humans are. Still, even like maybe that's just a, that's a thing that 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 person connects to on a level. I don't know. Like, yeah. like I said, I just think it's so interesting when it's just like, yeah, the political statement of just including diversity and stuff is like that's not that's that's no, not political it, to me but. it's it's not political people who make it political are the ones who are trying to force trying to create a political situation out of someone's simple existence and that including them somehow creates this statement that they are struggling to understand because they don't want those people to exist. yeah i know it's 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 wild to me yeah yeah uh, <laughs> and moving on. Anyway, there's uh, our soapbox. No, I think that's, moving on. What I'm saying, I think that that the 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 just that the the idea that there is this kind of dialogue happening is the key to the 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 toy maker episode, not what the actual political statements are. Just the idea that people get so ingrained in this, and the idea that you could weaponize that as a supervillain is a great science fiction conceit. Yeah. Absolutely. This idea that like the toy maker, the ultimate game is being right. And so the toy maker makes it so everyone thinks they're right and thus inciting chaos and madness. And then is there a more Doctor Who fitting ending than it comes down to a game of catch with a toy ball? <laughs> Like so I love really the two games they play in the episode are high card cut the deck the yeah. simplest card game you could possibly yeah. do and catch the ball. Uh, by the way, IMDb Trivia would like uh, would like you to know that being an accomplished magician, Neil Patrick Harris did all of his own card work. I was curious about that. And when I saw him shuffling the deck, I was like, is that a hand model or is that just MPH? Because I know he can do that sort of stuff. He performed all of the card tricks himself. Of course he did. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things that's that's most delightful about Neil Patrick Harris. What a fucking nerd he is, and he's a magic nerd. Possibly the nerdiest thing there is to be a nerd it about. Might be, yeah. It is, cl and and uh, I also have an affinity for close up magic, so I enjoy all that stuff, all the flourishes and everything he does. He's very good. Um, but yeah, that it that it comes to that, and then yes, at the end. And, and it connects back. It's very well written, of course. Well, it's very good, but the whole idea that, like, oh, well, the first toy ever was the ball. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, let's just... Both of those. Let's get these to the simplest thing you can do with cards and then the simplest idea of a game of catch for the fate of the universe. And there's this whole conceit they include that, like, okay... All gamesmanship is done in a two out of three basis that's so, like, primeval and perfect. Yeah. And so, in order to have a, a, the best two out of three at the final third game, you need two doctors to do it. Which is, yes, because that's the thing, of course, is that uh, we all, I mean, I was sort of watching this, as, as we all knew this was going to hand off to the, the next doctor. So, of course, anytime we go into regeneration, you're like, what's going to happen? What's going to set up our regeneration? And Russell T. Davies plays with our expectations, of course, because he knows we know that. And so you have in the final confrontation uh, between the toy maker and the doctor, the, uh, the 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 toy maker has gotten his hands on the gigantic laser weapon that's on <laughs> Unit Tower. Yeah, sure, of course. And he's in an old timey like World War One fighter pilot outfit because once again, very theatrical villain. Mm -hmm. um, and he just shoots the doctor through the chest with his giant laser cannon. And you're it's like, striking, yeah. just on a cinematography level, very striking image. Absolutely. And the way that, God, I mean, we almost haven't talked about David Tennant because it's just so, like, in he's some way. David Tennant is the doctor. He hasn't lost a step. No, he slipped that back on and he's, uh, uh, he's just perfect in the role, but the way he like bends back and takes that laser beam blast is also such a great piece of physicality. And then yeah, he starts regenerating. And you're like, oh no, the, we're gonna lose the David Tennant Doctor. And then 
we get the concept of instead of a regeneration, it's a bi-generation. Mm-hmm. It's a first. And I love the whole idea about like, but we always heard this was a myth. <laughs> and like, I'd be curious to go back into any Doctor Who wiki and ever, see like, it, has this ever been mentioned before? Probably not. No, because there are some Doctor Who fans calling foul on this, of course. But that's the same thing about like the Star Wars fans who are upset about force projection in Last Jedi. I was like, you can't do this. Like, just because we haven't seen anyone do it doesn't mean. And also, like, to keep things going, you have to keep introducing new facets to powers and stuff, right? Like, well, and wasn't it at the end? Wasn't he only supposed to have thirteen regenerations? So yes. Matt Smith should have been the last Doctor by right. Doctor but they rules. they due to the crack in time, all the other yeah. time lords give him their regeneration, so he has infinite now. Like basically, yeah, uh, yeah, yes. I mean, they've been they're rewriting they've, these rules as on the fly, like always. Of course, yes, uh, yes. This is, I am confirming via the uh, the Doctor Who wiki that uh the tardis wiki that um this is the first ever mention of it okay but anyway i like this idea that like okay non-linear regeneration as a concept is super fun to me because it just gives us more opportunities to play with extra doctors right and they did that a little bit in the last couple of seasons from what i understand uh with like the fugitive doctor Yes, that was that that was what I was talking about earlier with the whole idea of uh, that being the Doctor before William Hartnell, mm. and like there actually being more to it than than it seemed. Um, and like I said, yeah, but that, that's and, and that's that's great. I mean, seeing Doctors interact with each other, like I said, we expect that of an anniversary special, and it's always fun. And also, as a fan of it, number one, I love the visual of where they were still like only partially split. Gave me a very uh, safe odd Beeble Brox vibe. Sure. Where they were like halfway through, and uh, but uh, th- I, but then I also love the moment of when they both turn on him and it's like, oh shit, you're fucked now, toy maker. You got two doctors. My favorite part of their split is that they split the wardrobe as well. Yeah. So and the fifteen uh, doctor doesn't have pants. Doesn't have pants, uh, but he did get the shoes. David Tennant doesn't have shoes anymore. Yep. He only has the undershirt and the vest, whereas yep. 15th Doctor got the overshirt and the tie. So clever and so Doctor Who. <laughs> and I will say right away, Shudigawa, I-, I thought, was delightful. And I immediately went, oh, I like this doctor. He's a scamp. This guy's a <laughs> scamp. And uh, people brought this up. And a flirt. My God. There were a couple of moments where I thought the two doctors were going to kiss. <laughs> I do. I I love the. I love. Well, we'll talk about the very tender moment between them, where it is like, it's like, dude, I get you because I am you. Like that. Yeah. yeah. That there is this bond between them. But yeah, there. He's. I mean, he's. He definitely feels of the Matt Smith mold. He's a younger actor. He's only thirty one, uh, and and there's a youthful exuberance to him. That I are, that I can already feel from his you know whatever ten minutes of screen time, it yeah. does feel like it does feel a little bit like when we went to Matt Smith. He like, oh yeah, things are getting freshened up. There's some real new blood in the TARDIS, and I think I think yeah. that's good. I think that's what the show needs. Um, and I really love the whole like. You, there's this temptation whenever you have a character who's split down the middle, right, to have like, oh, now they're getting played against each other. But the unified front we get at the end of this episode really felt like, no, it's the Doctor and the Doctor, and they're going to be on the same page every time. Yeah. Also, th- there is something, uh, his background, uh, looking up uh, Shudy uh background, there's an alien quality. I couldn't, I was trying to place his accent. Mm. And then I had to look it up. He was born in Rwanda, but raised in Scotland. So he oh, has this interesting. Weird hybrid accent that works for the doctor. Because the doctor should always feel kind of ethereal, right? In that way, we were like, what? what is this guy's deal? And so the idea that he is uh, an African Scotsman is like, oh, yeah, that you don't see that. There's a vibe to him that's different. And, and, and yeah, I just I was instantly charmed by this guy, who I've only seen as one of the Kens in Barbie. Is the only thing I've ever seen him in before this. Mm, yeah, now I recognize him. Yeah, um, he's one. Is of, this one of our first Doctor with a mustache? Ooh, I I think it is. Obviously, uh, yeah. Hurt had the full beard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
No, but we've never had just as a the war doctor. Yeah, no, no, we've never had a mustache. I like it. All right. He's got kind of a. It, it reminds me of like a young Eddie Murphy mustache, like Beverly mm, Hills Cop era. Yeah. Eddie Murphy, where it's just sort of. It's not like a thick Burt Reynoldsy mustache. It's just kind of that. It's 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 not wispy, but it's thin. It's uh, yeah. Once again, that adds. To, I just like. I just instantly took a liking to this guy. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very curious to see the Christmas special. Um, obviously, the ease of being able to just like put on Disney Plus and get the new Doctor Who probably guarantees that I'll be picking Doctor Who back up as like a thing I'm watching again. Yeah. Well, because we're getting immediately after this, we're getting uh, on Christmas Day, we're getting the return to the Christmas special, which will be his the 15th Doctor's first full adventure and will introduce his uh, companion. Cool. I'm very excited for that because, yeah, I loved how the end of this episode wrapped up with the doctors kind of commiserating with each other and this, like I said, non-linear regeneration where it's like, okay, it is up to the 14th doctor to go through recovery for Mm -hmm. all the stuff he's been through up to this point post time war that is going to happen. And then this doctor gets the fresh face to go and to retire, right? It's sort of this thing about like, there's the whole, there's because, because the defeat in the toy maker happens and then there's probably another 10 minutes to the episode or so you know and and it's all this moment about like where it's basically even though it's the same guy and it's this bi-generation so he's kind of the same guy but he's kind of a different guy telling him like hey man i got this like it, it does feel like a passing of the torch in a way that it's never felt with with regeneration right where it is sort of like you can retire you can reflect you can deal with the wounds both physical and emotional you've incurred I'll, I'll take the TARDIS. No, you're still going to get your TARDIS, which I did love when he was like, I also love that thing, too. It's like, you won the game, you get a prize. And then he hits the... I also love that there's just a mallet in the... That <laughs> scene was where using like, some where fucking that? Looney Tunes logic there. Where there. is that? And he just opens up a panel and there's a big mallet and then he hits the TARDIS. And then one thing that instantly endeared me to shoot he got was Doctor is when he turned... After he hits the TARDIS, he goes, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm just like right because never forget of course there's the whole one of my favorites the Neil Game and the Doctor's Wife episode where it's like mm-hmm. no the truest companion his wife is the TARDIS yeah uh, I like that he has a jukebox in his TARDIS yes <laughs> and I love the way David Tennant walks and goes ooh jukebox <laughs> <laughs> he's just like ooh. uh yeah and I, I love that he like kind of cheekily tries to get away this Doctor does feel like a scamp he is a scamp, man. I, I, I immediately, yeah. It does, it does feel like a fresh, fun doctor, um, who, yeah, is at least mostly unburdened of a lot of his emotional trauma, and so is gonna go into uh, space and time with sort of this like "what's out there" kind of attitude. And already, just some of the pictures from his season. I don't know if you've seen him in his seventies get up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a very disco-fied doctor for at least one of the episodes in his new season that definitely okay. implies a very fun doctor to be had. And he's always sort of cheekily smiling in a lot of these pictures. They also just released the uh, a picture of him with his new sign screwdriver, which is completely different than anything we've seen. It's more rounded and flat. It looks more like a remote than like a tool. Interesting. Which I'm sure some people will be furious about. Um, but it's like, you know, look, man, <laughs> as with all of this stuff, it's like, it's new. It's, things get redesigned. It's one of the things. Embrace it. You know, I don't know. Uh, I was just struck at the end of this episode by how different it was from the last, like when David Tennant was handing off to Matt Smith. Yeah. And obviously we had like the 50th anniversary where they kind of like had a bit more of a reconciliation. But what was so striking of the end of David Tennant's run was his last line before regenerating was, I don't want to go. Yeah. And that felt like there was this stranglehold in a way on the show since then that this feels like it's kind of like letting out that breath in a way to me. It felt like a cathartic moment of just like, okay, he he can let go now. He can go on. He's always going to be there. And mm-hmm. that's the metaphor of the end of the episode, right? Like, he's off taking care of himself and retiring, and he's always going to be there. But he can let go, and he can 
leave it to the next guy in a way no, that it, it almost didn't quite feel that way with Matt Smith. Well, it's interesting because people talk about this. The David Tennant regeneration was the first time it was treated as a death. Yeah. All of the other ones were pretty casual if you watch them. And and, and I know because I, I just recently rewatched every regeneration um, because I have no life. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but like, no, I'm watching through them. And, and if you remember, of course, we remember the Eccleston one. Eccleston was just like, no, then another guy will come. It's fine. Like, it's not, there was no, the, mm-hmm. the, that was the first time there was like mourning, which speaks to number one, the public trust. I mean, because remember, he got this whole run of specials down the stretch, David Tennant. And it was, yeah. and, and the, England was like in mourning when he left. That's how popular he was. There was like, no, isn't there any way? Please stay. <laughs> we need <laughs> you. We love you so much. Uh, and even the the then then that sort of continued through, right? That the Matt Smith was given this very tearful send off. Peter Capaldi has maybe my favorite regenerate because he gets this incredible monologue where Moffat basically it's basically Moffat's like conclusion about what the Doctor is. Um, mm. it's wonderful, and then it's very interesting that the Jodie Whittaker one, though, pretty subtle, and turns back into David Tennant, and yeah. so it's it's a shame because like I said it's not Jodie Whittaker's fault, but I think Jodie Whittaker will be kind of like, oh yeah, and then she was the Doctor, which and that's, is that's wild because like she was the Doctor for three seasons. She yeah, she didn't do it for any. Show. I mean, she did it for the exact same amount of time that uh, Tennant, Smith, and Capaldi all did it. Three seasons is about what, and I don't I don't know if the plan, but at least Davies is talking about this new Doctor in a three season arc. So yeah, I, mean, I don't know if that. If, I mean, I, it's probably going to be up to him whether he wants to keep going after that. But at least the initial plan is there will be a three season storyline for this Doctor. So yeah, no, it's not. It's she didn't. She didn't like get canned or something like that, but there was definitely a distinct like you got. I don't. I don't think she got canned as much as it was more like you guys are wrapping this up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, there definitely was a recalculation. Teaming with Disney, that's key to something. There, there was definitely a new investment in the future of Doctor Who after the the Chibnall era. Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that is Davies like wanting to come back and versus studio pressure being like, well, we got to get the guy who we know is a sure thing back. I mean, something tells me, and this is purely my speculation, it was just like, Russell, would you ever like, <laughs> you know, let's just float the idea and he was into it. Um, mm. You know, and, and it's an interesting thing because I, I think he definitely at the time of leaving was like, well, I've said everything I'd want to say. And then clearly in the interim was like, well, maybe maybe there is something in there to say. Because he's certainly gone on to do plenty of other stuff. I mean, sure. uh, or- yeah. Torchwood was his baby. Um, and you know. Torchwood is its own little beast to untangle. Oh, but <laughs> I love me some Torchwood. Um, God, I love Torchwood. It's so weird. What Man. if we took the darkest, weirdest episodes of Doctor Who, cranked mm-hmm. those up to 11, yeah. and made that the whole show? Yes. Yep. Uh, I've never seen the show Sex Education, but the, this new Doctor was on there. I kind of want to watch it now, just to get a sense of him. I've heard good mm-hmm. things about it. I've just never seen it. Um, also, I could totally see he received uh, a commendation at the Ian Charleson Awards, whatever that first performance is, Mercutio in a production of Romeo and Juliet. This guy seems Ooh. like a perfect Mercutio. Mm. It was the, the get- stamp character of Romeo and Juliet, of course. <laughs> you know, a uh, uh, play replete with scamps of all stripes. <laughs> uh, and of course, people are being so cool about him being a black queer actor. Nobody has a problem with that at all. I, yeah, we've been dancing around some of the, the shitheadery that has emerged from this Doctor. Can we call it a revival? I don't know if we can call it a revival because Doctor Who really hasn't gone away. That's the thing about Doctor Who. It's it's one of the it's one of the craziest franchises to have been around for sixty years and never actually like rebooted in the traditional sense of continuity has always continued. Everything has always been canon. I guess the last Jodie Whittaker stuff was in twenty twenty one, so we've had a year. But like, you can blame the pandemic for that with basically oh, any that's, show. That's entirely what it is. It's just yeah, yeah. It, they 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 didn't. Uh... That wasn't like a planned thing. Um, no, right. Doctor Who, the biggest gap was post 
Sylvester McCoy, then the brief Paul McGann thing in the 90s until then. But even still, all of that stuff, even the fucking American TV movie with Paul McGann still starts with Sylvester McCoy regenerating into Paul McGann. So it's all still of the same thing. It's crazy to me. After he gets gunned down in San Francisco. Yeah, well, because, you know, those, those street ruffians. Um <laughs> It's but the wildest regeneration to me is just got to be yeah <laughs> street hoods gun down the doctor um <laughs> uh yeah uh i i i mcgann is always i've always wanted more justice for that guy cuz i think he's great that movie's not but he is great in it He's done a bunch of like audio dramas and stuff bunch right? of audio dramas and they've done a couple of comics mini series about him as well he's also mm -hmm. That's why he's also the guy too, or it's like he 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 really wanted to be the doctor. Like that was the and so it's always and he's certainly I mean he's on the aforementioned Luther. He definitely once again, the guy's not hurting for work, but it's always just sort of like, damn. He was really good. Uh so and was kind and was kind of the the David Tennant before David Tennant in some ways, right? Like he was younger, he was more handsome than we'd seen previous doctors. He was a little bit more dashing leading man doctor before that was the norm. So, mm. uh, unfortunately, you, you then the reverse is you have Eric Roberts as the master. And <laughs> no. no, no on Eric Roberts as the master. I said no on Eric Roberts. As the... I just don't think uh, Doctor Who should be an American thing. I just don't. I don't think an American Doctor Who is going to work. Like I, I agree. Yeah, I just think that there's something inherently British about it. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing yeah. as Bond. I never want, I've long on the record, I don't ever want an American playing Bond. Uh, that's got to be a British thing. I don't disagree there. Yeah. Uh, all in all, yeah. this like uh, refresh, this uh, relaunch. I mean, yeah. it's a soft relaunch. Yeah, I think, I think relaunch is a, is, a, is a better word for it. It's not rebooting. It's relaunching. It's a reintroduction. Certainly putting on Disney Plus means many more people are going to have access to this. And so I have, I have no doubt this will be a lot of people's first Doctor Who. I think this will be a lot of people's first Doctor Who. But in that same way that when we were getting into Doctor Who, we maybe had this vague idea of... Like, okay, there's a guy with a scarf and a coat, and I think oh. that is somehow associated with Doctor Who. Right. We're going to see this lanky man with occasional glasses and high tops. That is, like, vaguely Doctor Who to this whole new generation of people who are now getting him put on their screens for the first time. Yes, exactly. And I think that's that's the thing that's always kind of been a magic of it, right, is that, like... It's continually reinventing itself while also referencing the past. So it's it's always been good at bringing in new audiences while also acknowledging that it's something with a history. And I think this last one in particular, uh, uh, the giggle with bringing in the toy maker, like they they find a way to be like so reverential for the past. But also, if you haven't seen those, it doesn't matter. It's just you immediately get a sense of this character. And all that matters is that there is a history with the Doctor. Mm. Hey, John, you want to feel old right now? Sure. Always. S someone who was born yeah. th the day before uh, David Tennant first appeared as Doctor Who uh, is old enough to vote. Oy, boy. Yeah, that is... <laughs> Well, excuse me, I was talking to my sister about this because uh, she's a huge Whovian, and she was saying, she was going, this is the 60th. And she goes, we just had the 50th. I'm like, no, that was 10 years ago. She's like, no, that can't be right. <laughs> that can't be right. That's just not, that's not, what? Didn't we just have the 50th? No, 10 years ago we did. It was Matt Smith and David Tennant. They put their feet up on the table and they said no to the Zygons. I remember it. Oh, it's, it's so good. The Day of the Doctor is one of my favorite Doctor Who things ever. Yeah. It's same. wonderful. Yeah. I uh, so, But I, I am so looking forward to this new era of Doctor Who. Yeah, it, like I said, I, I, I stuck through the Jodie Whittaker stuff without liking it. But... Uh, you know. you, th between that and Star Trek Discovery, you just like spend so much time watching yeah. shows you don't like. <laughs> I know because I always want and 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 actually very similar in Star Trek Discovery. Every season was like this is the season we're gonna crack it, you guys. And you're like, no, I did finally give up on that. Um, but uh, okay. uh, but yeah, no, I did, I did because I just these 
Doctor Who and Star Trek are such enduring franchises for me. Um, sure. I mean, you know this. Look, you're a Star Wars guy. <laughs> Uh, look, yes, and I will eagerly watch whatever the uh, Book of Boba Fett Season 2 ends up being. Um, I'm on board for that, man. I, I, I unapologetically like Book of Boba Fett. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, but, but it does feel nice to be like, once again, like, almost like, I, I almost feel more valid in my dislike of that mm. when I see this now and I'm going like, oh, right, there, there is something here. There was some... I, almost unexplainable thing, right? Where it's just like, this is the blanket of, of who that I've needed again, where you're just like, oh, it's back. It's just, it just feels right again. It tastes right. It's, it's new. It's, it's, it, 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 and like I said, I, and I'm on board for that. This new doctor feels like he's going to have a different vibe than the other doctors. And that's great. But the show itself feels like it's still the show I love. Well, and we keep associating the show with Star Trek, but I think there's a lot of comparison to be drawn because they're sure. both incredibly long-running series that have had to refresh and reboot themselves time and time again. Yeah. But there is this intrinsic Star Trek quality that you can assign to shows, and when it's missing, that's, even if all the characters are different, like you can feel it. That's that was my, And that was exactly my issues with Discovery, too. I just kept going, it just doesn't feel like Trek. And then what really didn't help that, of course, was when they started making all this other stuff, Paramount Plus, and, going, and all of this does. You know? Yeah, like, even the animated comedy show feels like Trek. It's such purely good Star Trek. Lower <laughs> Decks is so fucking good. Um, so it's, it's really, goddamn, you guys, it's amazing. Uh, so we will cover uh, in a future panel up, I think we will do once a shooty got was season uh, comes to an end. His first season comes yeah. out. We'll do a whole episode about his uh, beginnings, the Doctor. Yeah, I think uh, giving him his own due at, for yeah, because uh, we his talked entire about whether, whatever the first season is. I think is we the talked right about one. whether to do this episode after the Christmas special. We thought no, just do these and then treat that as part of his run, and we'll talk about him more holistically. Because no, no offense, but he is got some big shoes to fill and yeah. like there is oh, some yeah. trepidation by bringing David Tennant back even if it was for these like three little episodes mm -hmm. you are setting an expectation for this guy no question and 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 also I mean every doctor you know takes a little while to get going you know it is sure. sort of like yeah. you know David Tennant I don't think had it necessarily in his Christmas special, it was mostly there. I think Matt Smith is one of the few ones where it's like day one, that first episode is perfection. His debut yeah. episode is basically perfect. The eleventh hour yeah. is like one of the best individual episodes of Doctor Who ever. Um I would say that first Matt Smith season is basically perfect for me. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. because you have like you've got <sighs> Time of the Angels, Victory of the Daleks, uh, the fucking Flesh and Stone episode, like that whole like Angels uh, two-parter there. Uh, you've got Vincent and the Doctor, which is yeah. just like perfect Doctor Who, basically. Yeah, that's about as good as it gets. That's another one people often reference as like if you're introducing someone to the show. And that season ends with the whole Pandorica thing okay, yeah. with Matt Smith's like monologue to every Doctor Who Hello, villain ever. Stonehenge. Yeah. Oh, so Question good. who's the Pandorica? Answer I do. Um, <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. Um, no, it's uh, so good. That, that, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. I do think the 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 writing of those Matt Smith errors is my those are my favorite scripts. I still mm. put David Tennant as my number one Doctor, but I think. Moffat's scripts are just incredible. Um, and I have a real, I, I'm a real, because I know there are some people who don't love Capaldi, and I'm a real Capaldi defender. It's not, it's not nearly the vitriol of the Jodie Whittaker, but there were some people who I think were disappointed after the fun youthfulness of Tennant and Smith that they went back to a more classic doctor, an older doctor, uh, a, a, a crabbier doctor. He's, he was a prickly <laughs> fellow. Capaldi's. Was not, you know, was not a, a, a warm, hugging doctor. I, Capaldi is definitely where I fell off. And I eventually did, like, watch up to the end of his uh, series. And, like, oh, what was the episode where he punches through infinity? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that will always, always, always get me. When it's just like, okay, we have a time loop episode. And he needs to punch through a wall that represents all of time. Yeah. Cool. Got it. It rules. 
It rules. <laughs> he's I mean, he's a badass. He's one of the most badass doctors. Mm. Yeah, he's not he's not going to be the guy who's once again going to give you a hug, but he is the guy who will punch through infinity. And he's going to yeah. play an electric guitar. When he comes in on top of the TARDIS playing an electric guitar, like, yeah, he's he's just a badass. And that's, so that's what I love about him. Um, yeah. So, yeah, can't wait to see what the new Doctor holds. I know, I'm yeah. excited we, to embrace this new era. We just get, like I said, we just get a taste. And I like this sort of cheeky gamp that we see in a little bit here. But, yeah, I want to see what kind of adventures he's going to get into. I want to meet his new companion, um, who's a, a young blonde lady. Uh, I want to see him kick Davros in the teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I can't wait for the return of Davros. Uh, and I know some people are pissed about that, too. Um, believe it or not. Because Davros isn't in a... He's walking now. And people don't like that. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> not my does Davros. He, Whatever. Does he have the weird face? Then cool. He's still got a weird fucking face, though. Yeah, that's all I really <laughs> Yeah, and he's still got, like, evil machination, so I'm on board. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, my God, the new companion. You want to feel old again? Uh, you're going to need the new companion sure. born in 04. <sighs> she <laughs> was born two years before Doctor Who restarted. Yep. She has yep. She has not formed memories prior to Eccleston becoming Doctor Who. Correct. <laughs> Millie Gibson. <laughs> Playing, oh, here's a Doctor Who name. Her companion's name, Ruby Sunday. Oh, that's good. That's, that's good. good stuff. That's good stuff, man. Can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait. Uh, all right, but next month, I know you're excited, Gregoni, because our next panel off episode will be mm -hmm. about... What? Uh, a What's little about? series called Monarch it, Legacy of Monsters. A Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, the, the, the show set in the... Was the what are they calling? Is it the monster verse? Is that what they're calling? It's the monster verse, yeah, yeah, the monster verse, uh, uh, uh legendary, legendaries, yeah, monster. the monster verse. I've wanted to talk about that show since the first episode dropped. Oh, but I've, I'm, I believe it. <laughs> uh, I have had to force myself to stop calling it the Godzilla show because, yeah. quite honestly, now that we're like as of this recording, most of the way through that series, yeah. Godzilla in it a relatively little amount. I will it's say, like basically just the inciting incident. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, as we, as as a staff, I'm not like a huge Godzilla fan. But I will say the first time you see Godzilla in that show does rule. I it, would say the second time you see Godzilla yeah. in that show also rules. Yeah, but it's very cool, and uh, we may touch on a little bit. I don't know if because uh, I, I weirdly I've seen it and you haven't at least last I checked. Godzilla yes. minus one. Um, Timing wise hasn't really worked out, but I'm going to see it. Uh, we could probably sneak a little minus one talk in we there. We might while get we're in there it. too because boy, oh boy, is that worth talking about? God damn, that is a picture. Yeah, yeah, can't that, wait. Is, that is as good as it gets right there, man. I gotta say, uh, Godzilla fans feasting well right now. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I, said, I, I keep telling people, it's like people are like Godzilla. I'm like, no, 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 you gotta go see this because le le legitimately, it's one of my favorite movies of the year, and it happens to be a Godzilla movie. You know, it's like, it's that good a film. Uh, Scorsese or Godzilla? Where does it rank? Well, obviously Scorsese still wins. Damn but, it. Uh, damn it. Damn I, it. It's <laughs> one of, it's still, it's not my favorite film in the year. It's fucking crazy, but it's going to, a Godzilla movie cracking my top 10, which I will have uh, hopefully next month for you folks here on the YouTube channel. I will be putting out a video with my top 10 of 2023. Danny Boyle's the killer or Godzilla? <laughs> it's David Fincher's the killer and no. David Fincher. Yeah, no, that's 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 two. It's 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 damn the, it, damn it, damn it. Two killer movies. It's gonna be lower, but it'll be top <laughs> ten. Jesus. Uh, Avatar the Way of Water or Godzilla minus one. Well, that came out last year, so <laughs> good. I win, finally. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I was always gonna put Godzilla over. I mean, I I I'd put some of the Godzilla movies I don't like over Avatar too, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not a fan folks yeah. uh, not a fan uh, anyway uh, of course if you want even more of this kind of nonsense and such uh, you want to head over to our patron page which is uh, patron.podbean.com slash punch up there you can get cool exclusive bonus content as well as help support the network and all the shows on it uh, if you are watching us on YouTube which we always recommend is the number one way to watch this show uh, not as visual when we do the panel up ones but you still get to see our pretty faces 
but normally when we <laughs> like that one in particular, um, but uh, uh, yes, uh, join us every week to talk about old Star Wars comics uh, and, and you get to read them along with us on there. So make sure you like, comment and subscribe below. Uh, let us know. I want to know who people's favorite doctor is. Put a comment below. Who's your favorite doctor and why? You don't have to give us an essay, but uh, you know, I I, I want to meet you, Pertwee fans. That <laughs> they have to exist, right? I enjoy a Pertwee. Pertwee's very fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, he how about how about that uh, time when the doctor didn't have the TARDIS and he just drove around in a jalopy? <laughs> Those were the days, man. Uh, <laughs> now that's my doctor. I would love it if somebody's like, now, until he gets rid of the TARDIS, I'm not going to love it. <laughs> really, uh, I'm more of a car-based Doctor Who guy. Um, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure they do exist. So, yeah, we'll be back next week with more uh, Star Wars talk, uh, including about Jabba the Hutts of all a number of T's in their name. Um, <laughs> but uh, that will uh, wrap things up for this month's episode of Panel Up. I'm John Campbell. And I will always be Mike Gurgoni. Till next month, we're going to panel down.